you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Our text for this morning is actually just verses 7 to the end, uh, but to put it in its context, especially in case you weren't here last week, I'll read it from the beginning. Um, first six verses, what theologians call general revelation. The unmistakable revelation that no one can miss, miss that shines out of the sky. Um, and then following that, what theologians classify special revelation, inspired word of God, which billions of people miss, which billions of people have no access to whatsoever, may not even exist in their language if they had a copy of it. So here we are with it in our language in more than a half a dozen really excellent translations. And I have no idea how many less excellent translations uh, beyond that. Um, uh, and so, um, as Paul says of those who have this revelation in the sky in Romans chapter 1, they are without excuse. He would certainly know of us here in America in a place like this, that we are without excuse if we are not fairly well acquainted with the written word of God. Um, the uh, message for this morning is aimed at uh, encouraging you to become better well acquainted with the written word of God because of what David says in Psalm 19, uh, 7 to 14. Let's stand together and we'll begin to read, however, in verse 1, as I say, and then we'll hit our text for this morning in verse 7. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose word is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. 
Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray together. Our Father, you are due our praise. As we have just read, day by day, we are reminded that you are glorious by what we see, by the rising and the setting of the sun, by the stars in the sky, and by the manifold beauties that are spread all around us every day, all day long including our health and strength and the ability of something like our eyes to show us these things with clarity and glory. And so, Lord, we do praise you for these things. And it is to you that we owe all of our vows to be paid for you are the one hearing prayer. And to you, all flesh, all created things shall come. But particularly, all human beings. Lord, when our sins seem to be prevailing against us, you are there to atone for them through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, through his shed blood upon the cross. By faith, we find the forgiveness of sins. Faith in and through your Son, Jesus. Lord, blessed are those who are here this morning whom you have chosen for yourself, whom you have brought near to yourself in Jesus, for they shall dwell, as the psalmist put it in Psalm 23, in the house of the Lord forever. They shall dwell as David puts it in Psalm 65, in the holiness of your temple. Lord, you have shown us awesome, awesome deeds. You are the God of our salvation. You are the only ultimate hope in this world. The only hope to all the ends of the world the only hope in the furthest reaches of the sea. You are the one who has established the world around us. You are the one who is able to manage everything that you have created perfectly. You still the roaring seas and the waves and the tumults of the people. O oh Lord, there's so much within the tumults of your people. So many roaring waves around us at times. And you know, Lord, that there are many in our congregation right now, when they look out on their lives, they see roaring seas 
and roaring waves and intimidating tumult. Whether those roaring seas be health-related, whether they be relationally related, whether they be related to struggles with one addiction or another. We look out and we see these roaring seas. But may we know and be confident that we do know the one who is able to still all roaring seas. You are caring for everything that we see around us. The world is in your hand at all times. You are the one who sends the rain. You are the one who grows the crops. You are the one who spreads out wild flowers in the mountainside with a beauty that inspires painters to paint. And you do it. And you show us these things. And so, Lord, we, we do praise you. For you are the God who has shown us your glory in countless ways that we might take you to heart and take you seriously. And we ask for you to help us to that end in the coming new year. In Jesus' name, amen. Receive me. As we noted last Sunday, the first half of Psalm 119, general revelation, the revelation of God in the sky. Uh, the thing about it is you can't possibly miss it. Everybody sees it. Everybody knows that it's there, including those who deny that they see it and who deny that it's there, who the Apostle Paul in Romans 1, as we've said, accuses of suppressing the truth that they see in unrighteousness. And so it is. But as we said last week, the first six verses are in a lot of ways like a, like a volleyball set for the, the spike of the psalmist's point, David's point here in the second half of Psalm 19, where he tells us that not only do we know that this glorious God exists, and we know that apart from any words that we've seen written on a page or any words that we've heard verbalized. But that God has verbalized his word. He has written it on a page. As Paul put it to Timothy, he has breathed out words onto a page. And so when you put the two sides of the psalm together, you can put the two emphases together by just reading verse 1 and then verse 7. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. The law of the Lord, the same Lord who created the heavens, is perfect. Reviving the soul or restoring the soul. My favorite Christian singer is Fernando Ortega, and my favorite song of his is a song called Jesus, King of Angels, which in the refrain, he wrote this. The universe is vast beyond the stars, but you are mindful 
when a sparrow falls. Now there's the same contrast. He's just set it up. The first half of Psalm 19. The universe is vast beyond the stars. But then we have a really specific word about that God from Jesus. But you are mindful when a sparrow falls. And then in the rest of the refrain, Ortega runs with that second line. But you are mindful when a sparrow falls. And mindful of these these anxious thoughts that find me, surround me, and bind me. We know about that at times, don't we? These anxious thoughts that find us, surround us, bind us. What a wonderful thing to know that such thoughts are finding you, surrounding you, and binding you. That you know the God who created the universe, and you know this about him. He pays attention to sparrows. How much more he pays attention to the people that he's created in his image. He's mindful of you. He knows all about your health. He knows all about your troubled relationships. He knows all about your financial worries. He knows all about your loneliness and fear. He keeps track of sparrows. He certainly keeps track of you. And he means to help you with these anxious thoughts that find you and surround you and bind you primarily by means of his word and the power of the spirit. That's what he says to us here in the second half of Psalm 19. But to be helped, you have to listen, take heart to what he has said. I've really particularized our, our thesis from this morning, but I, 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 I'll, I, would, uh, I would argue uh, for it, even though it is a bit of a stretch. Right? Our thesis, we ought to be diligent Bible readers in 2022 and for the rest of our lives. See, that's not really an argument for using the Bible reading plan. It does, that's not to say that David knew about Bible reading plans. He didn't. What he did know about, however, what he did know about was this. Um, You really need to have a diligent relationship with the Word of God, and he recommends it in in the strongest terms. And why those Bible reading plans work so well and are so important and so helpful is that we're sinners. They help us map whether or not we're reading the Word of God or not. See, we're the kind of people that imagine we practice our better habits a lot better than we actually practice them. We're tremendously capable of fooling ourselves. Are you a regular Bible reader? Oh, yes, I am. Somebody actually tracked. might not turn out to be so true. You didn't mean to be lying about it. You actually didn't know. You sort of imagined that you were because you you have no idea how often you read or how often you neglect. Well, if you use one of those plans, you'll have a definite idea, especially if you, like, check them off, which is a good idea if you've ever really struggled to do it. 
it's, it's a great idea. But the broader point that the, that the psalm does bring out unmistakably is a close relationship to the word of God makes exceedingly good sense. And it's an exceedingly valuable, life-transforming thing to have. It's the way God transforms lives, according to the psalmist and the rest of Scripture as well. But we'll make the case from this psalm, from five, five different vantage points. Number one, we should read the Bible for what it is. We should read the Bible for what it is. Verse 7 to 9, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true, unrighteous all together. I'm surprised he didn't say it one more time, because he says it six times. And seven, in a figurative book like the Psalms are, where there's lots of metaphors, would have made a lot of sense, but he didn't. But he did repeat it six times. Now I want you to notice that the law, the testimony, the precepts, the commandment, the fear of the Lord, and the rules of the Lord are all the same thing. He's referring to the first five books of Moses primarily. That's what David would have had in his mind. Not so much to the various aspects. Now, you can nuance those words a little bit, but that's not the main point. The main point he's making is to say the same thing six times. Now, that's important to notice. The same thing six times. Now, it's not really super important, however. The super important thing to notice is that it's the precepts of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the law of the Lord, command of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the rules of the Lord. Yahweh, covenant God, the one just spoken of in the first six verses as the majestic God who created the universe. It's his words that we've got access to. That's an incredible thing. This book that David is talking about is the Lord's book. It's the Lord's book. The law of the Lord. The fifth of the sixth description. The fear of the Lord. It's just talking about the book again. The fear of the Lord is clean. But make no mistake about it. Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. That is, the written word of God is the beginning of knowledge. Wow, how ridiculous. Well, no. How obvious. See, the fear of the Lord, the instruction of the Lord tells you where you, God created this universe. That's how it got here. You are created in his image. That's who you are. You are created for a relationship with God. And you'll never be really happy without it, because that's what you were made for. 
And until you know such things, you haven't even begun to know. You have no idea where you are. You have no idea who you are. And you have no idea what your life or anybody else's life is about. But the fear of the Lord, the instruction of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, they answer all those fundamental questions, and you have begun to know where you are and who you are and what you're supposed to be about. And so if you want to be one who fears the Lord and is wise, well, these words got to be your words. Psalm 34, David put it this way, Psalm 34, 11. Come, O children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. By that he means, I will teach you Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's what he has in mind when he says the fear of the Lord. We have the 66 books of the canon now. And we should say to ourselves, oh, come and let us learn the fear of the Lord. Let us learn this divinely revealed perspective to, to sort of paraphrase uh, David's words there in Psalm 34, 11. Come, O children, read your Bible and ask the Lord to use it to teach you God. Teach you the fear of the Lord. Secondly, You should read the Bible for what it does for us. You should read the Bible for what it does for us. Now, it's at this stage in a psalm like this that you realize the wisdom of somebody, you know, like a David Martin Lloyd-Jones or a, a, a Charles Spurgeon, who would be exceedingly unlikely to uh, preach the second half of Psalm 19 in one in one sermon. Um, and, and why and what makes good sense about that is that you could certainly build a sermon about each one of the results of this statement, right? The, uh, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Uh, the fear of the Lord, you know, the instruction of the Lord is perfect, reviving or restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple and on down uh, through the six, that almost begs, right, for six separate sermons. But the, the instruction of the Lord or the law of the Lord, we're just going to just touch on two of them very, very briefly because they're, they are application-oriented. Um, he uses the same verb here, by the way, in the second half of the opening sequence there, the instruction of the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul, you say, restoring the soul, it's familiar with it, King James, Psalm 23, well in Hebrew that's exactly the same verb, the instruction of the Lord restores the soul. Um, when, when life is crushing all the hope out of you, this restores the soul. Right? Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. So I've mentioned quite a number of times, I, I remember uh, the night after my heart attack in the middle of the night, laying there awake, it's two o'clock in the morning to three o'clock in the morning, about what just happened. In the evening, they told me that my my heart was fairly wildly out of rhythm and that it might correct itself. And you can really feel it when it's 
fairly far out of rhythm because you can't draw a satisfying breath. You can try to take a deep breath, but you just won't really get a deep breath. So you know, you can tell it's still out of rhythm. Why? Because you can't draw a satisfying breath. And so there it is, 2 o'clock in the morning, you can still see, and they've given you the warning, right? Oh, you, you know, this, this is a, when, you're, when you're in this state, you're just in a lot greater danger of stroke. And so we can't let this go on very long. If it's still like this in the morning, there'll be two specialists who will come and they will lay out for you the options of how they might get your heart back into rhythm. They both have risks, but we just going to have to do that if it doesn't correct by morning, but hopefully it will. Well, there you are. And that little, as I said, that little word from working through the Hebrew text of Psalm 23 came to me then. It opens just Yahweh, the Lord, and then a participle. The Lord is the one shepherding me. The Lord is the one shepherding me. He's not surprised where I'm at. He knows all about how hearts work. He can do anything. The Lord is the one shepherding me. What a relaxing thought. What a soul-restoring thought. See, there you are. It's a sense of panic. Like, what is going to happen next? Things are already not going well. Now what? I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know, and what you know, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, is that the Lord is the one shepherding you. And I fell asleep. I woke up in the morning breathing pretty well. The nurse telling me, hmm, your heart's back in rhythm. They've canceled the visit. Now there was still bad news yet to come. <laughs> however, however, the instruction, divine perspective has a soul restoring tendency to it. That's what he's saying. It's true. It's absolutely true. The command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The command of the Lord is pure, causing the eyes to be enlightened. What an important thing it is because we, if you have any idea about where you live, you know, you are walking about in darkness. I'm reading some essays right now each night by a prominent atheist. He's got to be one of the most unhappy men on earth, one of the most hopeless angry, bitter souls that lived writing back in the 1940s. Just as you would expect, right? Here's how Paul describes the world in which we live. Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. Now this I say and I testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding. 
They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. This guy is clearly darkened in his understanding. He thinks because of tremendous insight, but it's, it's actually simply the hardness of his heart. And what he needs is, you see, is this word from the Lord that causes the eyes to be enlightened. And you can see that it's possible to know God. It's possible to know that you are in the right relationship with God. It's possible to have assurance that you have come into possession of everlasting life. That's what the, our trek through 1 John was all about. These things are written. That you might know that you have eternal life. The word of God is capable of light like that. Thirdly, and that's just two of the two brief puzzles on six benefits he just lists out there. Six benefits in a row. It does this, it does this, it does this, it does this, it does this. Thirdly, we should read the Bible for its great value and pleasantness. We should read the value for its great the Bible for its great value and pleasantness. Two metaphors. Gold, honey. Gold, the value, representing value. Honey, representing pleasantness. The value of the word of God, that's a, that's a favorite theme uh, in, uh, in the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 19, Psalm 119 in particular. Here's two places where it's in Psalm 119, verse 72 the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Not just more valuable than gold, but more valuable than lots of gold, he says. Lots of silver. Psalm 119, 127. Therefore, I love your commandment above gold, above fine gold. Solomon, Proverbs 8, 10. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. See, the psalmist knows us. He knows we always wish we had more money. Oh, if only we had more money. If only we had this amount of money. If only we had this amount of money. If only we had this amount of money. Then maybe. And he says, well, let me tell you something. You should have that attitude about your knowledge of the word of God. If I only knew it this much better, or this much better, or this much better, because it's more valuable than the thing that you're so eager about. And so prone to daydream about, and so prone to imagine about. It's better than that. We're doubtful, but he says, it's true. It's true. I mean, be honest. If somebody told you how you could certainly make several million dollars in the coming year, and you believe them, you would probably be willing to rearrange your schedule a bit to carry out the program. Most of you would. He's just saying, this is better than that. Your chance for the word of God to know God better through his word is more valuable than a whole bunch of money. Because that's what he means by gold. Much fine gold. Money, lots of money. Worth more than that. That's what he means. Sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Sweeter than honey. See, honey's like the big sweet thing in the ancient world. We don't think about that honey. We're candy people. 
Uh, we're, we're, we're candy and pie and cookie people and cake people. Um, and so you can, you, can, you can substitute any of those, any of those things. Uh, there's, a, there's a candy store at the corner of Michigan Avenue and Wacker Drive in Chicago. It's the Fannie Mae, it's the Fannie Mae candy store there. Like everything else on Michigan Avenue, which they call the Miracle Mile, they call it the Gold Coast, because it's expensive to live there and everything there is ridiculously overpriced, uh, every, every single thing, except in like Walgreens or something like that. Um, and so, but um, at the Fannie Mae candy store, I, I like a melt, chocolate covered butter creams which they have on sale for $25 a pound <laughs> that's the sale price the regular price is 30 regular pri regular price is 30 $25 for a 1 pound box of those now what kind of idiot would buy that not often, but like when I turned 60, we did that. We went down there and I, and I bought one of those and, and uh, I think Shirley brought something out of there uh, too. But I, I always buy the same thing. I mean, that's, uh, see, what, he, what he's saying, see, is that the word of God is more satisfying than the Fannie Mae milk covered, milk chocolate covered, Buttercreams, it's, it's, it's more satisfying than that. It's better than that, right? Um, so that's, you know, like the way I walk down the street when I'm going to go, you know, get that. that. That's how you ought to be as you get ready to open your Bible in the morning. Oh, man, I get to go. I get to go and look at the Word of God and see it and know that it's tremendously valuable and it's tremendously pleasant. And the two things, you know, they, they, they meld together. They meld together. Uh, Peter saw this. John 6, you remember the story where most of the followers of Jesus are deciding they don't want to be followers anymore because of these hard things that he said about eating his, blood, eating his body and drinking his blood. And uh, they, they're, they're saying enough is enough and they're not following anymore. And when they're all walking away, remember, Jesus turns to the disciples and says, are you, do you want to go away too? And they say, And then Peter steps forward and says, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Now we're out of time and we still have two points left. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to meld them together here like this. We should read the Bible, and this is a really surprising one, and again, you know, probably worth a sermon in and of itself. You could go on and on like this. We should read the Bible for its warnings. Well, nobody likes to be warned, right? We don't go looking around for warnings. We want encouragements, not warnings. No, he says, no, no, that's a wonderful thing about the word of God. It warns you. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Now think, just think for a moment about what he's going on. Now he's going, to, he's going to expound a little bit on how those warnings, what those warnings protect you from. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Some of you know well about this.
because you have sins, presumptuous sins. And by presumptuous sins, he means the really discernible kinds of sins. You, like, they're, they're, they're like the stars in the sky. You can't miss these. You can't miss these. You know, when you just tell a bold lie, you know you've, you, you know you've sinned. When, when you're falling down drunk, you know this wasn't a good idea. Um, uh, when, 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 you're, when, when you're looking at pornographic images, you know that you would quickly close the thing if Jesus came into the room. You're no doubt about the sinfulness of your activity. And if you're addicted to any of those things, then you understand where he starts. Oh, what a blessing if you got warned away from that in the first place, because it's a lot harder to get away from it once it's, once it's got its grip on you. Once it rules over you. And some ignored the warning on the front end. And hopefully you've learned about just how valuable warnings are by how hard it is to get away from the rule of sin on the back end. Keep your servant back from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Let them not rule over me. See, what a valuable thing to be warned so that you don't end up ruled, ruled by things that you wish didn't rule you. And there's so many of them. But then just quickly to move on, finally, we should read the Bible for the sake of spiritual transformation. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable, be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, my rock and my redeemer. Our words and our thoughts. God's really aware of both things. He's always, know he hears everything we say. And he hears everything we think. If you were in a Sunday school class uh, this fall on James, James 3, 2. For we all stumble much. If anyone does not stumble in word, this is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. But you know, as difficult it is to keep your words in check, it's even more difficult to keep your thoughts in check. You think many things you'd never say out loud. And you think them quicker. And that's what he's talking about here. The word of God is to train you so that it it starts to transform you in this way that's most difficult to be transformed. It's easier to train anything else than your tongue, outwardly. That's, that's James's argument. Everything else is easier to train. Everything is easier to train. Stupid dogs are a lot easier to train than you and your tongue. Donkeys are a lot easier to train than you and your tongue. Name the thing easier to train, James says, than you. 
and your tongue. But the what the Lord uses to train you and your tongue and your thoughts is this word. Is this word. And he says, here's his prayer at the end, Psalm 19. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart let them be acceptable to you. So train me by means of your word that I'm so transformed that even my words reflect your words. Even the meditations of my heart reflect your words. And as you look in on them, they're acceptable to you. That's a high goal. That's a lofty goal. And that's what we're looking for. And so back to Pastor Don's announcement about the reading plans. Um, Probably the best reading plan verse text In the Bible, in some ways. It's Joshua 1 8. Because it just mentions the book. This book, this book of the law, shall not depart from your mouth, just as we headed here, your mouth, but you shall meditate it on it, your thoughts, day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way, your spiritual way, prosperous. Then you shall have good, spiritual, God-related success. Because the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. And the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple, and the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart, and the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, more to be desired than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them is great reward. And this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we do pray that you would take your words and transform us with them. Restore our souls with them, strengthen us with them, give us words and thoughts that are well-pleasing to you as we are increasingly conformed by your spirit to your word and way. In Jesus' name, amen.